Have you ever been on a train, maybe an underground or subway train, or near the track, and your ears have been subjected to a horrible screeching sound as the train goes round the curve? Stopping this noise is one of the many reasons why lubrication is required in plain line sections of the railway. A lot of effort goes into looking at the lubrication of the more complex parts of the railway, such as switches, point operating equipment and fish plates, but normal plain line rails need some love too. So let's dive into the various reasons why lubrication is needed on track and what makes some lubricants better than others. But first, through my time within network rail maintenance, there was one brand that would always be in the stores and that was the sponsor of this video, Interflon. Interflon's range of lubricants and other products cover all the bases for railway maintainers. They have products for all parts of the railway where the smooth movement of components is critical to keeping trains moving on time and realising full asset life. This can be from the inside of point machines that swing the points to the counterweights that ensure the overhead line is correctly tensioned at all times. They even have their leaf guard solution that solves the issues of leaves on the line that all railway people love being asked to explain by their friends. For me, I used Interflon's Metal Clean to remove even the most stubborn build-up on switches so I could undertake a detailed inspection for defects. Afterwards, I would use their Grease OG to give the best protection to the switch tip from damage and wear. When it comes to lubrication on the railway, Interflon really have got you covered. To understand why lubrication is needed, we first need to look at the issues encountered on plane line and, most importantly, why they occur in the first place. Trains are moved by their wheels rolling along the rail surface. There is constant contact between these two metal surfaces, unless something has gone massively wrong, that is. Due to this contact, friction occurs, which is the resistance that one surface of an object encounters when moving over the surface of another. Friction between two objects leads to them wearing over time, sometimes creating noise and also some heat generation. Think of rubbing two sticks together to start a fire. The extent of the wear depends on a few factors, such as the level of force involved and the hardness of each material, for example. If we look back at rails, the passage of train wheels and the associated friction cause wear and damage that can be categorised in a number of ways. There is also another pretty critical risk as well as the noise issue I've already mentioned. Let's start with the type of wear and damage that you might encounter on the rails. Side wear. I think you'll agree this rail doesn't look right. That's because it's sideworn. Side wear occurs when the lateral forces exerted by a train cause wear on the side of the rail head. These lateral forces occur as trains navigate curves in the track most commonly. With the lateral force pushing the wheel and its flange up against the rail, which increases the forces and the wear on that rail corner. This is why the wear is concentrated on this part of the rail. Side wear commonly occurs on curves, especially curves with a tight radius. This is due to the fact that the lateral forces increase as the radius of the curve decreases. Now, there are two factors at play that can cause this wear, and also which rail it is on. First is the angle of attack of the wheel. Within a curve, the train wheel and its flange are not running parallel to the rail, but at an ever so slight angle to the outer rail. In effect, the wheel is almost driving into the rail. This angle increases as the curve radius decreases. Train wheels are designed, ideally, to run parallel to the rail. This is when they are at their best. Sharp radius curves bring in this angle of attack, which increases the forces on the rail and the wear. Also, it changes the part of the train wheel which is in contact with the rail, again increasing the force and the friction, which in turn leads to greater and faster levels of wear. The second fact is the usage of the curve. Bear with me here, as we need to delve into some of the basics of track geometry design quickly. Railway curves have can applied to them, the lifting of the outer rail to help manage the lateral forces and the train turning. Great, I hear you say, this is the sideway problem solved. Well, not quite. The level of cant on a curve is determined in part by the speed of the trains traversing it. But only one speed can be used, and rightly, it is the highest speed that the curve can be traversed at, the line speed. This ensures that trains can safely travel around the curve at the full line speed. Not a problem with that. However, not all trains are doing this top speed. Big, long, heavy freight trains are not doing the same speed as the fast inner city trains generally. So when they come to the curve, at a lower speed, 
the curve for them has too much cant. Without the speed to generate the lateral force pushing the train towards the high rail, the mass of the train pushes them onto the low rail. They are then said to be riding the low rail, causing it to wear. On top of this, you can also throw in a little operational complexity. There is a curve in the area that I used to work that illustrates this perfectly. It had a signal for a junction at the end, so a freight train would come round a relatively tight curve, which was canted for the full line speed of 30 mile an hour, see the red, stop, and then sit. This meant it would sit with a large amount of force on that low rail. When it was time to move, with a green signal, the forces must have been immense, going from a standstill up to line speed, riding on that low rail. It's safe to say that the rail was always sideworn, with wear on new rails appearing quickly after installation. But what could be done, as at times the trains would come round that curve and not have to stop at all? If you want to find out more about CAN, how the correct amount to apply to a curve is calculated, as well as how it helps manage the forces of a train, then I have the perfect thing for you. My free guides CAN ebook, delivered straight to your email inbox, simply by hitting the link at the top right hand corner now, or in the description below. So why is side wear an issue? Ultimately, the rail is losing material, which weakens it. Side wear also changes the profile of the rail. Rails are designed with the profile they have to perform correctly. Any changes to this profile changes the way the rail performs. The loss of the material on the gauge face also increases the track gauge. This can lead to levels of hunting from a train as they try to self-centre on the track. This in turn increases the likelihood of further damage to the rails. Then there is putting new rails in. Side-worn rails can be ground, normally by a specially designed train, to restore their profile, but long term they need to be replaced. When installing new rails, the running surfaces, the top and the gauge face, need to be matched to ensure a smooth continuous surface for the wheel. However, with a side-worn rail, this is hard. This can lead to long re-rails being required between less side-worn areas. Failing to account for this can leave a rail end standing proud, waiting to be struck by a wheel as it passes, damaging both the rail and the wheel, or something even worse happening. If the rails are to be welded together, it can leave the welder with a large amount of grinding to do to blend in the surfaces. When it comes to rail damage caused by the friction, the stress and strain of train wheels against the surface of the rail, there are two that really stand up. Rolling contact fatigue, RCF, and gauge corner cracking, GCC. Similar to side wear, these types of rail defects are not isolated to a single location like squads, but can stretch for long lengths. Failure to properly address either can have catastrophic consequences, perfectly illustrated by the disaster at Hatfield, where RCF led to the failure of rails and ultimately the deaths of four passengers and over 70 injuries. For more on this tragic event and the lessons learned from it, check out my video linked in the top right now and the description below. While both RCF and GCC have similar root causes, they do differ in mechanism, location on the rail and impact on rail integrity. Let's break them down into location, mechanism, characteristic and their impact. Let's start with gauge corner cracking. GCC typically occurs at the gauge corner of the rail, which is the edge of the rail head on the side where the wheel flange makes contact. This can lead to a combination of side wear and GCC. GCC is primarily caused by high lateral forces exerted during the passage of trains through curves. The repeated stress and strain at the gauge corner leads to the initiation of cracks. These cracks usually start as small surface cracks and then propagate downwards into the rail head due to the continuous cyclical loading. When it comes to their characteristics, these cracks appear at the rail's gauge corner and can be visible as fine lines. They can lead to spooling where small pieces of the rail material break away exacerbating the damage. In terms of its impact, GCC can significantly reduce rail life if it's not managed, leading to an increased maintenance needs. And it also poses a risk of rail failure if the cracks propagate deeply into the rail itself. Rolling contact fatigue. In terms of location, RCF can occur on various parts of the railhead, but is commonly found on the running surface where the wheel tread makes contact with the rail. In terms of mechanism, RCF is caused by the repeated rolling contact stresses between the wheel and the rail, leading to material fatigue. The cyclic nature of these contact stresses causes micro-cracks to form and propagate over time. 
In terms of characteristics, RCF damage includes a range of defects, such as head checks, squats and shelling. These defects often appear as irregularities or surface cracking on the rail head. And then its impact. RCF, again, leads to surface irregularities that affect the smoothness of train travel, increasing noise and vibration. Severe RCF can also result in rail fractures and potential derailments if not properly managed through regular maintenance and grinding. So, you can see they are similar in some respects, but also distinct. They both, however, introduce a risk of rail failure that needs to be addressed. Grinding or milling of the rails can remove both GCC and RCF if they're caught in the early stages. They can also reduce the severity to buy maintainers time, but again, to fully remove both, the rails must be replaced. An added issue is that heat introduced by welding rails together can further open up the cracks, making them worse. This requires careful checking of cutting points. Flange climb derailment. Whether it can be from sideware, GCC or RCF, rails on curves are prone to wear and damage, but that is not the only risk. There is also the risk of the wheels riding up the rails and derailing, just when you thought you couldn't get any better, huh? Known as flange climb derailment, more commonly associated with switches, this is where the wheel flange rides up and over the rail head, typically due to excess lateral forces, poor wheel rail contact, or inadequate track conditions. Excessive lateral forces, where have we mentioned those in this video already? Yep, tight radius curves. The surface friction, part of the wheel rail interface, plays a key part in this type of derailment as it assists the lateral forces in overcoming the vertical forces to move the wheel up the rail face. This derailment type is the primary reason why you see check rails on tight radius curves. I have a video looking at this in depth if you want to know more, linked in the top right now and the description below. Noise. Rail damage. Tick. The risk of train wheels riding up the rail face and derailing tick. Compared to those, noise almost seems a trivial matter, doesn't it? But it isn't. Ask anyone who's been on the London Underground train and had to sit through wheels screeching. Bad as a passenger, but imagine being the driver who has to do that multiple times per day. Lineside neighbours also do not want to be subjected to that terrible noise either. Apart from being unpleasant, it can also lead to hearing damage if repeatedly exposed. So, all in all, not great. Not too much fancy to say about noise, apart from that it is the byproduct of the friction. Similar to dragging a chair across the floor or nails on a chalkboard, it is a very noticeable symptom that there is another issue at play, which may prompt you to check for sideware, GCC or RCF. The solution. There are multiple ways to address the issues we've gone through in this video. Recanting the track, changing line speed, tight radius curves have check rails fitted to mitigate some of the risks, and rails can always be replaced but these options are not always viable, especially in the case of changes to the track layout. Changing rails has a cost to it and takes time, which maintenance teams often don't have an abundance of. Lubrication can, however, help with all of the above issues. It won't by any means solve the underlying cause. It slows down wear and the creation of RCF and GCC. It reduces the noise level and the flange climb derailment risk, all through reducing the friction between the wheel and the rail. Lubrication is also relatively easy to install and low cost to boot. Both big positives when it comes to looking for solutions or mitigations. Lubricators can be fitted to the rails at the entrance to tight curbs or sites where issues have previously occurred. They allow train wheels to pick up the chosen lubricant and carry it through the curve. Different types of lubricators can try and get the lubricant onto either the gauge corner, the rail head or both. But not just any lubricant will do. You can't just use trusty old WD-40. The lubricant chosen has to have specific properties. It needs to be weather resistant, so it stays on the rail through rain, snow and frost. It also needs to work in a range of temperatures, from summer heat to winter cold. It needs to have good adhesion to the rail, so it doesn't just run off the rail surface. Finally, it needs to have extreme pressure properties. This means it can withstand high load and pressure conditions, like a heavy train going round a tight curve. This video's sponsor, Interflon, has products in its range that meet all of these criteria and more. So do check them out for all your railway lubrication needs. So I hope you can see why lubrication on those tight curves is beneficial and needed. Please do give this video a like, hit that subscribe button to support the channel and drop any questions or queries in the comments below.